That's enough of all of that. Are we ready for a word? Good. We are in a series entitled Living to a T. Living to a T. It's a series about how we should want our life to be to the T. Uh, in other words, we should want to get our whole life together. And we should want to dot our I's and cross all of our T's. And so with that in mind, we understand that this is a series about stewardship. We already said it last week, right? Stewardship isn't only about money. Stewardship is about the entirety of our lives. It is simply how we manage the life that we have been given. Okay? And that life that we have been given, we should want to steward it well. And so we are discussing six, I really would suggest we'll work through it, seven, but six T's of stewardship, six major aspects that cover our lives. Uh, we talked about the tithe. We talked about that in a whole separate series, right? Must be the money. Giving God first, the first 10% of all of our increase, because when we give God the first, he redeems the rest. It is about stewarding what we have. I don't care if you make $5 a week or $5,000 a minute. You should give to God first and then steward the rest. Last week, we talked about time, that it is a gift that we should prioritize well. Because we only have one life, and time is not something that we are going to get back. So let's keep building. Stand, if you are physically able. Let's give reverence to the word of God. Stand and turn with me uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm just going to read three verses for context, but we'll look at a bunch of scriptures today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 4. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. If you have a different translation, I promise it'll read all the same. First Corinthians 12 verse 4 says this, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. But the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. The spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. I want to tag this text with this title, The Talent Show. You may be seated. The Talent, The Talent, The Talent Show. Go ahead and put our first few T's up there, six T's. Let's see how many we have now. Tithe, time, and today, talent. Talent. Let's talk about talent. I never, I never participated in a talent show. I always wanted to. I used to watch those old school TV shows that are long gone now, Sister, Sister, and Boy Meets the World, and Step by Step, and Family Matters, and Laura and Eddie would get on stage at the talent show. I never had the guts to get on stage and do the talent show, but I was always appreciative of these people who would get up and perform in front of audiences and try their best to display what they thought they could do well. But then, if you watch enough TV or seen enough talent shows, you know that I remember the episode of A Different World where Gladys Knight is in town and they're trying to participate and sing back up with Gladys Knight, but there is always one girl who wants the spotlight. Always one who thinks she's better than everybody else. And so they had to lock that girl in a closet so Whitley and Jaleesa could go on stage and perform with Gladys Knight. Maybe you don't remember a different world. I can also remember Eddie Kane. Eddie Kane Jr. Don't, don't y'all want to sing with old Eddie Kane? Eddie Kane wanted the spotlight, though. He wanted to be out front. Everything. Maybe you don't remember old Eddie Kane. What about my boy David Ruffin? 
David Ruffin said, listen to me, Otis, it should be David Ruffin in the temptations. He, he, he wanted to be out front. He wanted the spotlight on him. And if you notice, everybody who wanted the spotlight ended up in trouble. Can I tell you, though, that's how God feels when you think your talent is better than anybody else's. Sit up in your seat. That's how God feels when we try and steal the spotlight from him. Because let me make sure that I'm clear on this at the beginning, that the talent show is our talent on display for God. Not for us. It is our opportunity to use what we have to bring attention to who gave us what we have. Paul would say it this way. Paul would say that we are actors on a stage made to look foolish to the world, but to bring glory to God. Let me see if the text will preach. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, put it on the wall. Verse 7, the message translation. Eugene Peterson makes it real plain. Let's walk it. He says, for who do you know that really knows you, that, that knows your heart? And even if they did, is there anything that they would discover in you that you could take credit for? I mean, isn't everything that you have, the house and the car and the strength and the hair and even the extensions, isn't everything that you have, isn't everything that you are, how tall, how dark, how light, how skinny, how big, isn't everything you are sheer gifts from God? So, so Paul says, what's the point of all this comparing and competing? You already have all you need. You already have more access to God than you can handle without bringing either Apollos or me into it. You're sitting on top of the world. At least God's world. And we're right there sitting alongside you. It seems to me that God has put us who bear his message on stage in a theater. On stage in a theater, watch this, in which no one wants to buy a ticket. You out here performing a show, don't nobody want to watch. We're something everyone stares around, stands around and stares at like an accident in the street where the Messiah's misfit. And so here's the question then, if no one really wants to see the show, except the people that God personally invites to the show, then stewardship says we have to stop thinking we're the main event of the show. Press pause, rewind the tape, say that again. If no one really wants to see the show, except who God personally invites to the show, then stewardship says we have to stop thinking that we are the main attraction of the show. This is what the text, this is what Paul's letters to the Corinthians, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians, are trying to get us to understand. This text is powerful and robust because while we will survey other scriptures today, it is a great platform to understand how God has uniquely gifted us. Uh, I'm not looking into a deep dive into pneumatology today. Pneumatology will be the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Pneuma, spirit, wind, tology, study of. I I'm looking at what God does, though, with what he has to give out. Okay, if you come on Wednesdays, we, we take a deep dive. I should get a bunch of amens from a Wednesday crew, because here we go. Because technically, talents, spiritual gifts, and skills and abilities are all different. They are all different. If we were to break down the nuance, here it is, get your pen and paper out, pull your phone out, get ready, take notes. If we were going to break it down, the nuance would look like this. Spiritual gifts are received by the Lord. They are received from the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, you got to have him before you have it. You, you can't get a spiritual gift as an unspiritual person. You've got to have a relationship with the master in order to get the blessings that the master has. Okay, so, so a spiritual gift is given by the Holy Spirit for the edification of the body of Christ. Okay, here it is. Here it is. Now let's go a little further, though. A talent, a talent is inherited in creation. There are just some people who are just talented. 
Some people who are just talented, you were born with it. It was passed down from your parentage or given to you in the womb. It is something that you inherited, this nuance, this life that you have been given. But then there are skills and abilities. Abilities and skills, and that is when you take either of the two above, whether that be the spiritual gift, whether that be the talent, or anything else in particular, and you spend critical time honing that skill or ability. That, that maybe you were not born with it, or maybe that is not something that, that pops up in your spiritual gift test, but it is something that you work at or work on. If you would enroll in step two of the Star Trek, we'd help you discover that about yourself. But for the sake of stewardship today, for the sake of teaching and preaching, here it is. When I use the word talent today, this is what I want you to hear. I want you to hear all three. I want you to hear all three because we need to steward all of them. We need to steward our talents, our skills, our abilities, and our spiritual gifts. Uh, because Matthew chapter 25 and Luke chapter 19 teach us this context of all three. The scripture says that a nobleman comes and he passes out talents to three servants. Three workers, he gives them, watch, watch this, he gives them something they never had before. It's something they never had before. He gives them also, he is the nobleman with the power to give it. And he gives them a talent. A talent would have been in this time, in the context of the scripture, a, a measure of weight. It was a measure of weight. And in a literal sense, they received weight. In a practical sense, they received something that was a gift to them. And they were supposed to steward well the gift that the noblemen gave them, that they were supposed to hone their skill and ability and take it and produce something with it even beyond what the noblemen gave them. And so the question that was asked of them will be asked of you one day is, what did you do with what he gave you? Here's the reality that we are all in an ongoing talent show. And we need to make sure that we handle our time on the stage of life appropriately. I, I need you to understand something real clear that your life is the anointed Apollo. Oh, some of y'all got to remember the Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. It used to come on all the time on the weekend. Your life is the Apollo Theater where you get up before God and you serve and function and activate before that person watching the show. Why do I bring that up? Because you don't need the Sandman to come sweep you off. You don't want the Sandman to have to show up and sweep you off because you're not willing to participate at the level that God expects of what he gave you. But you've got to do well with the life that the Lord gave you. And when, not if, and when the master watches, we need to remember that the Lord is the most important viewer. Amen. Here it is, just a few things I want to share. I'll get out your way. First thing we need to learn about our talents, if we're going to steward them well, is their designation, the designation of talents. The question is, how did we get what we got? Bad grammar, good preaching. How did we receive the talents that we have, the talents, the spiritual gifts, the skills, the ability? How did we get it? Let's look at the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, Paul says in verse 6, I don't want you to misunderstand this, that God works in different ways. But it is the same God who does the work in all of us. This ought to be a clarifying and humbling moment for us. Because Paul says, while you guys are arguing over what is greater, and who has what is greater and what you think is greater, you are missing the point. This is what Paul wants them to understand, that you can steward the what and still miss the why. 
God, help me, help me. Okay, let, let me see if I can make it real plain for you. Let's, let's break it down here. This designation of talents first then has to deal with our possession of the talent. Our, our, our possession. Let's start here. Possession. Here it is. That bottom line within the issue of delegation is possession. Here it is. Plain English. Please hear me. When talents, when gifts, when talents, when skills were being passed out, when skills and abilities and spiritual gifts were being passed out, here it is. Breaking news. You got one. No, 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 no. You hear me. Hear me. I don't care who you were. I don't care who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you will do. It doesn't matter how worthy you think you are. You got one. You, everybody in here has a talent and a skill and an ability and a gift. God may have worked differently through us. God may work differently in us. God may display it differently from us. But God does work through all of us. Mm, that's okay. I'm going to help the two people in here that maybe you're sitting there and you're concerned, you're insecure, and you're sensitive, and you feel inadequate, and you don't feel good enough. John chapter 13 verse 29 paints a picture to us to remind us how good our God is when he gave out the gifts that he had. Watch the text. John 13 29, the Good News translation says, since Judas was in charge of the money bag. Some of the disciples thought that Jesus had told him to go and buy what they needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. That's okay. I missed it the first time too. Sit up in your seat. You got to understand what's happening at the text. This is Passover. This is John's version of the gospel narrative where Jesus is about to be at the cross. They're sitting at the final Passover. They're sitting at what we now call the Lord's Supper. And they're having a conversation around the table. And Jesus has already began to disseminate his discourse and have his dialogue and tell them what's getting ready to happen. That he's got to be hung and bled and died and that who will betray him and who will deny him and he looks at Judas the text says who was in charge of the money bag you still not getting it say with me he looks at him and says go do what you must do and the Bible says that the disciples thought oh that's no big deal because Judas always has to leave and go pay the bills Judas always has to leave and make sure the lights are still on Judas always has to make a bank run that was his job maybe y'all not getting it we talking about Judas we, we're talking about Judas the betrayer, Judas the thief, Judas the embezzler, Judas the wretched and the ratchet, not the righteous. We're talking about Judas the messed up one was in charge of the money. God help me today. Jesus chose Judas. No, no, let, hold on, hold on. Let, you're not getting it. Judas is C -E CFO of Jesus' Ministries Incorporated. Jesus is the business manager of the first church ever. He pays all the bills, and yet he was a crook. He would steal money from the money bag, and he would be the one who would betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. When the woman showed up with the alabaster box, you know who got upset? Judas. Because Judas was like, bro, we could have used that money. Let me translate that. I could have put my hand in that pot. I could have did a little something with that money. You need to understand, Jesus chose Judas. It's still not good enough to you. You got to understand, Jesus knew who Judas was and chose him. Jesus knew that Judas was wretched and ratchet before he chose him, and he still chose him. Jesus knew that Judas was good with money and would steal money and still chose him and didn't just chose him. He had Matthew, the tax collector. He had other people who were good with money, but he still chose Judas. He chose Judas to be the treasurer because Judas was the best with the money. How do I know? Because you got to be great to embezzle and not get caught. <laughs> I'm trying to teach y'all this book. You, you got to be great to cheat and the ministry never go broke. You got to be great. The issue wasn't if he had talent. The issue was how he used the talent. 
That ought to encourage somebody in here who's been down and out and been trying to compare themselves. That ought to help everybody in here who's been to prison or sick or you feel too young or too old that you don't need to beg for something that you already have. You, you don't have to beg for something that you already have, that God looked at you with your wretched, wretched self, and he still chose you. He still picked you up out of the muck and the mire and the mess and the manipulation, and he still blessed you with a gift that you didn't deserve. God, help me. He still blessed you with a talent that you didn't ask for. And so here's what I need you to get that I don't need you to beg for what you already have. God just needs you to be somebody he needs you to be. He needs you to live how he wants you to live. It's an issue of possession, but in delegation, it is also an issue of parentage. Parentage. Not only does delegation involve possession, but parentage. This means that we need to know not only that we have talents, but we need to know who gave us the talents. It sounds simple, but we don't live like it's simple. Because if you haven't figured it out, we got it from God. We didn't just get it from our mama. We got it from God. Even if we are talking about an inherited biological scientific trait, we still got it from God. Because Jeremiah reminds us of that in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 when the Lord talks to him. He says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. In other words, before your mama met your daddy, I knew you. Be before they was kicking it, before they were doing what they were doing, I already knew you and created you. Corinthians says in our text that everything was given by the same spirit. This is why this ought to be humbling and clarifying. Because how I act with what I have and how I use what I have will be based on re remembering who gave it to me. Let me see if I can make it real plain, real plain. I'll never forget, I'm 16 years old, 16 years old, and I got a gift. I got a gift. Uh, I, I was driving. Uh, I got a gift of a car. I got a gift of a car. I got a car, my first car. Uh, uh, my parents had made me work each summer. I was saving my money up. I found out later, hindsight later, they just took that money, put it in a savings account, and they worked hard, and they got me a car. Well, no Bentley. These kids these days, you know, they need a Benz as a first car. I don't get these kids. I had a Dodge Neon. Yeah, I remember that joint. I had a black Dodge Neon, and I love that joint. I, I know these kids, they new age, but I went to AutoZone and got the shiny hubcaps. I ain't had no rims. I had the shiny hubcaps. I went and got the seat belt covers. I went and bought some LED lights and taped them on the bottom. How many people remember the CD player? You had to pull the face off and put it in your pocket. Yeah. That's what I had, my, my Dodge Neon. I'll never forget, I got in that car, and I was feeling good, and I was driving a little reckless. I was. I got stories. Y'all be quiet. I got stories. But, but I was driving a little reckless, and I was driving, and I got a speeding ticket. I got a ticket. I got a ticket, and so I had to go home and tell my parents, I got a ticket. And they gave me that look. I knew it's about to be some smoke in this house. I got a ticket. And, and after everything else, after I probably came to, I don't remember the whole conversation, but I do remember this. I remember my dad and my mother looking at me saying, I need you to understand, son, that, that my daddy was doing most of the talking. He said, I need you to know that it was my money that bought the car. He had me look at my mother. It was her money that bought the car. It was our credit that bought the car. It was our effort, our time, our resources. We went and got it, paid for it, drove it to you, made you read the instruction manual. In other words, son, you wouldn't have the car without me. And if you forget me when you're in what I gave you, you won't have it anymore. I got in that car and I let jokers blow the horn at me and drive around me and give me that finger when they drove by. I didn't care because it ain't no way I'm going to lose the gift that the parentage gave me. I'm trying to help some people. I started driving with a knowledge that if it wasn't for mama and if it wasn't for daddy, I wouldn't have what I have. I wish I had some people then in this church 
who understand that somewhere I got to work and sing and build and do businesses and create floor arrangements and walk around my house and work out at a checkout counter like I know it was the Lord who gave it to me. It was the Lord who opened doors no man can shut. It was the Lord who put me in this position. It was the Lord who made a way out of no way. It was the Lord who got me up. And I got to work like I know that if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have anything. It's about, it's about delegation, about delegation. Here it is. Let's keep working. Let's keep building. Number two, it's about the diversity of talent. It's about the diversity of talents, meaning that everybody has something different. And even if we have something the same, it is often expressed differently. Let's look at the text. Verse 4 and 5, 1 Corinthians 12, put on the wall, it says, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts. But the Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. In other words... We were never meant to look alike. We were never meant to function alike. We weren't even meant to sound alike because we are diverse. Because unity does not necessarily mean uniformity. That we can be on the same page even if we don't look the same. Okay, So here it is. Same spirit, different service. And different does not mean detrimental. Okay, so in other words, I don't have to look or sound or be like anyone else in order to be talented. This is why stewardship is huge. Come here. This is why stewardship is huge. Because when I am not participating in what God gave me, in the way God gave it to me, that's bad stewardship. When, when I am trying to use my talents the way I have seen others with the same talents that use their talents, that's bad stewardship. Let me say it again. When I try to use what God gave me in a way that God gave somebody else something, that's bad stewardship. That's a conversation that my wife and I have had for years now. We don't have to have it anymore, but for years there was a sense of insecurity in her, a sense of inadequacy in her. That she had, she had a very heated conversation with a particular individual one time because they wanted her to sing like somebody else. You got it in you, sis. You got to do this. And here's the note and do this run. And she said, I'm sorry. My name don't start with a K. I ain't Corinne. I ain't Karen. I ain't Kiki. I ain't none of them. I ain't Kim. I'm Shanicia. I don't sing like that. This is just not how I do it. I will sing to the best of the ability that God gave me. And stewardship says that I know I am talented, but I will use it in the way God designed me to use it. That does not mean that I will not constantly improve what I have. It just means I'm going to do it the way God told me to do it. Uh, I'll never forget. Y'all heard the story. My daughter, she'd been wanting this technology for forever, and we wouldn't give it to her. And so she wanted a YouTube page when she was real little. When she was real little, she wanted a YouTube page. And we got on my wife's iPad one day, and my wife had a plethora of videos. It was like 30 videos on her iPad. She's like, what in the world are all these videos? She started going through them. And it's my daughter doing mock intros for a YouTube page. She got a whole video, y'all, of her introducing herself and introducing the page on YouTube. And here was the problem for us, that as we watched the videos, we kept saying, that looks like our daughter. I mean... That looked like that looked like my eyes, baby. That looked like your cheek. That looked like my baby, but it don't sound like her. It don't. Who in the world is this little girl on the screen? Because she was on there. Hello, guys. How you doing? My name is Eden, and welcome to my YouTube page. And I just wanna. And we were like, uh, uh, Eden, come here real quick, babe. Who is this? And she said, This is me. These are the intros to my YouTube page. And I said, This don't sound like you. This not how you talk. This is not how you sound. Why would you do it? She says, because this is how they do it. Wait, what? She says, yes, if I show you my favorite YouTubers, this is how they do their page. I said, oh, that's good, but the page you start is your page. 
She said, excuse me? I said, that's good that they do that for their page. But if you're going to start one, you got to sound like you for your page. Because here's the reality. If our talents become identical, then the world loses what God put in us. Let me see if I can help you. They, they, They say imitation is the highest form of flattery. And I get it. I get it. But I also say imitation is the fastest way to failure. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. I understand. They say imitation is the highest form of flattery. But let me also tell you that imitation is the fastest way to failure because you can't succeed walking in shoes that are not yours. Come come here, Bible. Come here, Bible. If you turn to Acts chapter 19, you find a story of Paul in Ephesus. Paul is in Ephesus. He runs up on a few disciples. He says, have you all received the Holy Spirit? They say, what Holy Spirit? He says, hold on. Then what baptism have you been baptized in? They say, John's baptism. Paul says, no, that was a baptism in repentance. It was to point you to the one who was to come. His name is in Jesus. He prays over them. He baptizes them. They, he lays hands on them. They are filled with the Spirit. The text keeps going and says, he went on teaching in the synagogue many days. Power came from him that napkins and aprons had the oil of the Lord and that people would walk by Peter's shadow and get healed. Acts 19 is powerful, but right there in the midst of it tells us there were some Jews who were following Paul around. And they were watching him with power heal people. And so these these men rode up, these seven sons of Sceva, they rode up on a demon one day, a demon-possessed man, and they said, well, hey, you, in the name of Jesus that Paul prays in, you come out. And the demon looked at them and said, oh, no problem. Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who in the world are you? And the Bible says that this one demon-possessed man jumped on these seven sons and whooped them so bad that they were bloody and embarrassed. You're not understanding what I'm saying. That in other words, they were too busy trying to imitate Paul's power instead of having it themselves. They were too busy trying to be who God never called them to be. And therefore, they found themselves embarrassed and failing because maybe it's not working for you because it was never meant for you. You got to do what God called you to do in the way that God called you to do it. Here it is. Stewardship involves diversity. Here it is, the designation of talents, the diversity of talents. And finally, I'll let you go to brunch, the duty of talent. The duty of talent. Because everybody has talent. They are different, and they are all disseminated from God. So here it is. Let me try to make it as simple as possible. I'm going to use the most academic language I can find. Here's Stewardship 101. Here it is. If you have a talent, use it. You have a spiritual gift. If you have a skill, if you have an ability, if you have a talent, use it. I got Bible. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. ESV says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. Let's go to the wisdom tradition. Proverbs 25, 14. A person who promises a gift but doesn't give it is like clouds and wind that bring no rain. In other words, what good are you to have this on the inside of you and then you're unwilling to use what God gave you? What is the point of being able to do something that you are now unwilling to do? Now, here's what you got to get. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. Let me give you some tension in text because Romans also teaches us for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. So we got a problem then. It means we got a problem that you can have a talent, you can develop a skill, and you can be given a gift. God will never take it, and then yet you never use it. We got a problem. And so that means that you may never lose the talent, but you can snooze the talent. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you may not be able to lose the talent, but you can end up snoozing the talent. 
let me see if I can make it plain. I've told this story before. It's worth telling again. But my schedule in this season has happened to me again. My schedule uh, has messed me up in regard to my exercise regimen. Uh, this, this past season of my life, I'm done with that semester, but this past semester was so rigorous, I was not able to keep a steady rotation of going to the gym. And when papers and midterms and finals started coming up, I was skipping the gym for weeks at a time. I would not go for a couple weeks at a time. Well, here's the problem. I like to train hard. I like to lift heavy. I want to take care of my body. True story. When my father overcame prostate cancer, we made a deal that I would would take care of my body, that decision that we made in that hospital room. So I've made that effort. The problem is I missed working out. And then I decided when everything was over to go back to the gym and then I was going to work out in the same way and in the same level that I had always worked out. The problem was I wasn't halfway through my workout before I couldn't get up off the ground. Because I strained a muscle. I went to the doctor, talked about it, said, you got to you strain a muscle. You're going to have to rest. you got to put some heat and some ice. He said, because what you're dealing with is what they call muscle atrophy. Muscle atrophy is when you don't use a particular muscle for a certain period of time that it begins to shrivel up and weaken. It gets smaller. And so he said, you try using muscles you haven't used in a while, and that muscle was weaker, and your body made sure to tell you, nope. You're not getting ready to abuse me like that, that you ain't used me in all this time, and now you think you're going to come in here like you he-man and lift? No, it doesn't work like that. But can I tell you that maybe there's some people in here, your talents got atrophy. Maybe your spiritual gifts got atrophy. Oh, you don't think I'm telling the truth? Maybe your relationships are jacked up because they got atrophy. Because when you don't steward something well, it gets weak. And I pray that this becomes a season in your life and in the life of our church where you get your talent back in shape for the glory of God. Because we cannot keep sitting on what God gave us. We have to use them because they have a purpose. Two quick things. I'll let you go. What are their purpose? A, to demonstrate love. The first duty is to demonstrate love. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, our text, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Come Wednesday, we'll unpack that more. Talents are not about me. Neither are they for me. I am not gifted to be gifted. I am gifted to serve other people. I am gifted to love other people. Listen, Jesus himself, the human of Jesus, was not talented or gifted to be liked. He was powerful for the people. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Because if the most talented individual to ever walk the planet didn't set up shop and sell tickets to his show, who do we think we are? Now, hear me. Here's my disclaimer. I'm not hating on business. I'm not hating on industry. I'm not hating on you being a CEO of a company or starting a small business. I'm not hating on your cash flow or your ideals or your work ethic. But what I am saying, though, is that if what I have is only for me, we have a problem. What is in me is not only for me. It is to help other people for the glory of God. Because the diversity is about unity for the benefit of the community. This diversity is about unity for the benefit of the whole community. That my talents will help you one day and then I will realize another day how your talents help me. Uh, i never forget my wife and I, we attended a, a worship workshop. It was put on by a friend of ours, uh, Pastor Jackie. Love you if she ever watches this. But we learned she was reteaching this idea conceptually of the difference between melody and harmony. Uh, 
She was teaching the difference between melody and harmony. What's the difference? Melody, she said, melody is notes in succession. It is just notes back to back. It is one melody, a string of notes back to back. She said, harmony is a bit different. She said, harmony blends notes from everywhere together. It is not a straight line of notes. It is multiple notes you can find on that line that you bring together. She said, in other words, she said, any one person can sing the melody, but it takes multiple people to sing a harmony. She, she said, you got to understand what harmony means. Harmony is your soprano, your alto, and your tenor. She said, we can make it real difficult. It's your soprano, your alto, your tenor, your baritone, your bass. It is your first soprano, your second alto, your soprano. Your, it, it is a variation of notes that you put together. And she said this. She said, if the notes are all the same, you're flat. If your notes are all wrong, just turn the mics off. She said, and if there's only one person singing, we have a problem because it takes all of the voices to make the music sound good. I need y'all to get this. It takes all of the voices for the song to come out right. It takes all of the notes for the music to be what it's supposed to be. And I'm here to tell you that God gave each of us talent so that the music would sound good. That everything that we display would sound good. That it is a demonstration of love to God. That God, I love you so much that when you see all of us participating in the power and the skill and ability that you've given us, it becomes music to your ears. It becomes worship to who you are. It's to demonstrate love. Finally, I'm done. Worship team, you can come on. We're going to display the Savior. Duty of the talents is to display the Savior. I want to make sure I'm, fa I'm faithful to the scripture because I think we have done a bad job in Christendom of making too much about this, too much of this about us, when really all of this is about God. That's why I got to end the way I began because I'm not going to ever get up here and tell you do this so you can get a car and you can get a house. I hope you get it, but that ain't the point of this. The point of this is so that you can display the Savior. When Paul opens in 1 Corinthians 12, he says this, No one can say Jesus is Lord without the help of the Holy Spirit. This is what he was trying to say. You can't speak that kind of knowledge without God giving you that kind of knowledge. He says, and then he gives that speech as gifts to the body. And all of the gifts are speaking and revealing and enforcing and empowering and clarifying the knowledge that we did not have prior to our relationship with Jesus Christ. And what is that knowledge that we didn't have? that Jesus is Lord. What is that knowledge that we didn't fully comprehend when we were out there and lost and sinful and confused and broken that Jesus is Lord? What is that knowledge that we didn't have when we didn't have the answer or know the way out or know what to do is that Jesus is Lord. That he loves you, that he died for you, that he got up with all power in his hands, and that we exist for his pleasure and his purpose. And because of that, he gives us his presence and his power and his spirit to do what we could never do on our own. In other words, Paul said that this talent show is not so people can see your talent, but this talent show of life is so that people can see your Savior. Yeah. I just want a church. I just want a church that we learn how to shout because we want to empty hell and feel heaven. That we want to serve in a way that says, I want the crackhead on the corner to meet Jesus and become a businessman. I, I want the prostitute to come home and turn her life around and never be the same. I want that broken marriage to get back together. I want that lost child to come home. I want the Savior to be seen. That I want to feel heaven and let them know that there is a God who loves you no matter what. And he's put something on the inside of you. 
So much so that you got to remember, I don't have it on the wall. Listen to me. Write it down if you want to. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, work willingly at whatever you do. Whatever, if you bagging groceries or driving Uber, work, whatever you're doing, if you're stacking chairs or taking photos, whatever, if you're answering calls or typing on a computer, work at whatever you do as if you're working for the Lord. Because if you build a house only to get business, you work the food truck or stock the shelves or work at the hospital, you work at the school or the company, and it's only for you, then you missed the whole point of the talent show. Because the show was to display the Savior. The talent show was for him. I'm not going to make a long plea, but, but, but I am intentional because you need to understand.